So Ode to a Nightingale perhaps best demonstrates, as I've said, that subject-object dichotomy, that movement from one side to the other. Uh, if we take Ode on a Grecian urn, immediately that key preposition in the title that signals a further level of complexity, that we're not simply dealing with an address here, an apostrophe to, Ode to a Nightingale. We've got Ode on a Grecian urn. And that difference in preposition from to to on makes a huge difference in terms of the complications of the poem. So what I would like to talk about just briefly with Ode on a Grecian Urn is, I suppose, the, the degree of intensity that I would also like to capture as one of Keats's key characteristics the idea of intensity. Intensity itself as a kind of mode of art. That might be something we might want to add to the equation that we've got so far. The idea that intensity for Keats is where poetry takes place. Now that might sound odd in terms of where we began, in terms of a state of the relaxation of the body, a state that he has to call in gender terms laziness. So how do we get from laziness to this kind of high excitement? And I suppose it goes back to what I was saying earlier about by losing parts of oneself or imagining that one can lose one's whole self, that actually triggers a kind of different level of awareness of self, that one is crossing over those borderlines into an outsider position. There's a kind of thrill to be had in those transitions a constant thrill of moving backward, backwards and forwards with these losses of extinctions and annihilations. As I said earlier, that might be a vocabulary of destruction, but it also might be a vocabulary of excitement. Indeed, a vocabulary of the sublime. So in the case of Ode on a Grecian Urn then, we've got a poem which is riddled with a very particular kind of excitement, um, full, uh, as I always like to think, of exclamation marks and question marks, uh, the kind of thing that definitely shouldn't take place in a student essay. But with a romantic ode, that's fair game. So that kind of excitement is being registered. You only have to look at a page of, uh, of Keats's poetry to see the proliferation of exclamation marks and question marks. So we've got there both excitement and a kind of questioning, a very febrile, at times, kind of questioning, a kind of excitement through questioning. And I think this poem more than most of Keats's poems, and certainly more than any of the other odes, is about that meeting of excitement and questioning, the coming together of those two things. And in terms of much of its content, I think we'd also say that that comes together in a particular way about the body and romance. Um, I mean, one of the phrases, I think, for me, captures something of the danger that Keats is exploring in the poem is happy, happy. Um, I always think that happy is good and that the happy, happy might be deeply worrying, uh, in not to say off-putting. So I think when Keats puts happy and happy together, when he overloads it, then it signals a problem. It signals an excited question mark. Happy, happy is taking things to excess, is taking things one step too far. So it, there's a danger signal resident in that. I mean, Keats is interested, as I said, in this idea of intensity, because intensity tries things out. Intensity found, finds the edges, finds the borders of things. So happy won't get you very far, but to go over the top into the happy happy pushes you right to the verge. And in terms of romance, of course, I mean the happy happy here is a very paradoxical happy happy. The young lovers depicted on the urn um, are full of anticipatory excitement, but not consummation. 
They're forever young, forever panting, forever about to kiss, but never actually reaching that moment of the kiss. So what we've got here is an exploration that leads us to the brink, to the edge, to the edge of the urn, to the edge of romance, while never satisfactorily enjoying it to the full. And of course, what Keats is doing in his exploration of identity in relation to romance is taking us to the edge of an urn that, though unstated, we know contains the ashes of the dead. So depicted on the outside of this poem, if you like, because the poem in itself is on an urn rather than simply to an urn. We've got the possibilities, the anticipatory, the promissory glories and joys of love and romance. But what is contained within them at the heart of the urn are the ashes of the dead. So what we've got here is a very strangely configured object, both as poem and as urn, where we've got high excitement, intensity, all the youthful joys of life, but the interiority of that, the inner facing walls of that, are cradling the ashes of the dead. So this poem, in some ways, might be seen as an ode to joy, as an ode to romance, but it's also a kind of elegy, an implied elegy. So it contains anticipation and already achieved destruction, side by side. So I want to take that one step further, um, finally, by having a look at Keats's truncated ode to autumn. And I think that's where I think we should be, as I've indicated already with the preposition, ode to a nightingale the particular form of the titles of these poems. So Keats, in this, what is thought of as perhaps the final ode of the sequence, leaves out the word ode altogether. It just becomes this truncated to autumn. Now that might mean that ode, as we've seen, Keats is the kind of poet who can imply things. So it might be that ode is simply a silent implied, an effaced, implied form that lurks behind this. But it might be that we're moving one step further, so that actually he's exploring this interface between the ode form, which contains the possibilities of high excitement and sensationalism and romance, with the form of elegy. So what we might get in Ode in Two Autumn is a pastoral elegy meeting with an ode about romance. And I think one of the, th the peculiarities of this ode, if, if we take at the other extreme, Ode to a Nightingale, where we've got, as I said earlier, kind of subject-object, I dominantly, an I-thou poem that is making that journey between the I and the thou and the return back in repeated forms across the different stanzas. First thing to notice about Two Autumn is this occlusion of the I. The eye is missing. So we only get, in a sense, one side of the equation here. We get the other side. So the whole poem becomes kind of melancholic and muted and a veiled, implicit celebration of the cycle of things. And the way in which I think best illustrates that, of Keats's pushing things to the limit, pushing categories to the very edge, to the, the liminal, to the very edge, that intersecting zone, zone being one of Keats's favorite words, to the zone of things, would be registered not like happy, happy, which I was using as a, that repetition there as a trigger to explore the liminal zone of the poem, or I as I was using forlorn and its repetition as a, a, an approach to thinking about the limit of the poem in Ode to a Nightingale. Here, we've got other imagistic depictions, I think, which take us to the edge. And they're based on an implied narrative, an implied cycle of the seasons. So I don't wish at this point, before I end, to 
alienate any vegetarians present. But we do have a reference to fully grown lambs in this poem. And I think that's typical of Keats, that he images before us what might be a sweetly pastoral scene. But if lambs are fully grown, I'm sorry to say, they're ready for the chop. And that's impending, inevitable cycle of the seasons. In other words, we're looking at a kind of high summer come autumn in this poem, the richness, the fecundity of the produce of nature. That's what makes this poem famous. But it's pushing at the edge and implying an ongoing narrative that we can't do anything about. And in some ways, we might say that this poem, in pushing at that limit of things, at pushing at the idea of how far can you travel from late summer into autumn before you arrive at the edge of death, is maybe the territory that Keats finds exciting. That's what makes the poet, this poetry a poetry that's always on the edge, but it's always framed by a darker sense of death. But it's been, in that journey, a real exploration of some of the contending forces, as I hope I've illustrated, that make creative identity, as identity is something that we can explore in part and in some quite fascinating physiological and poetic ways by leaving it behind. Okay.